All right, welcome to the Beginner's Guide to Learning Unix. With FreeBSD, the 2021 edition, uh, this is part one, installation. We're gonna get a Unix environment working. Um, what we're gonna do overall is we're gonna install the working Unix system. And by Unix, I mean Unix or Unix-like. In this case, I mean Unix-like. I'm not gonna install HPIX or AIX or whatever the heck it's called. And I'm not gonna install Solaris or anything like that. We're gonna install something that you have access to as a normal beginner. You go on the web, and you find one. Um, you really have two major options for this stuff. You either pick a, a FreeBSD or you pick a Linux. Um, they're very similar in the user experience, uh, very different in kind of how they, how they provide that Unix, that user experience. But I'm gonna use FreeBSD, because I like it. I like Linux too, but I use FreeBSD more for this kind of thing, this kind of thing, because FreeBSD's a little bit more self-contained, a little bit more rational in how they put pieces together. Um, they, the, the FreeBSD folks control both the kernel that boots the system and provides the Unix uh, system calls and stuff like that, and the user land, which is a lot of the user utilities. Whereas in Linux, Linux provides the kernel and nothing else, and um, GNU user usually provides a lot of the user land, and they borrow user land from here, there, and everywhere. Um, so I just to keep things simple, I'm going to use FreeBSD. Um, we're also going to do it without a, without a GUI. We're going to use the GUI of the operating system. So if you're on a Mac, you've, you've got uh, you know, the Mac UI, which is uh, beautiful up through, I don't know, Catalina. And then it jumps over to looking like your iPhone in the latest version. But basically, it provides you with a GUI. Yay! And then if you're on Windows, you're using, I don't know, what it's called now, Arrow or something. But basically, that interface is okay, too. If you're on Linux, you got KDE. So why mess with greatness? You're already familiar with your own GUI. So all we're going to do is we're going to add something like that looks something like your command line, um, which is basically a big black window with some stuff you can type. You can type things to list your files and stuff like that. Um, that's on a Mac. On a, on a Windows PC, it looks kind of similar and does similar sorts of things. Well, that's where the real power of the operating system is. Anyway, um, Windows uh, are pretty much the same between all the different Windows managers and, and desktop editions. They just provide a different set of buttons up here and maybe some different ways of showing the screen shrinking and growing and stuff like that. But they all kind of do the same thing. Once you've used one, you've used pretty much all of them, as long as you know how to right click and two finger click or whatever. So we're really going to we want to we want to learn about Unix. We want to learn all the command line tools, like how do we list files, how do we find text in files, how do we locate files throughout this file system, how do we um, how do we take pieces of files, how do we do all those kinds of things, and so this this is going to cover some of that. So we're going to have to get an environment started. So the first one we're going to try to get is FreeBSD. Um, the already kind of talked about the advantages. Um, the disadvantages are it's not a GUI. <laughs> and, uh, and your copy and paste capability between these, between the, um, the guest operating system, that FreeBSD thing that we're going to run, and your host are somewhat limited. We have to learn workarounds for that because they don't natively support that kind of thing. So that's the disadvantage. Don't worry, we'll cover it. So what are the prerequisites to get started on this? Well, you have to have a um, host operating system which we'll talk about, but you have to have VirtualBox. So we'll, get the we'll figure out how to get the installer, how to install it. We need the FreeBSD media, meaning some kind of install media. And then we need either to be using Mac, FreeBSD, Linux, or maybe Windows, or whatever operating system. It doesn't really matter as long as it hosts VirtualBox. All right. So um, in terms of installation, where it's going to be pretty simple. We're just going to boot the installer. We're going to follow the prompts. And we're going to reboot. And then I'll talk about next step. So without further ado, how do we get this stuff rolling? Let's find VirtualBox. So in your, uh, in your system, in your uh, pull up a browser, such as Firefox, and in your search box, you can type VirtualBox, hit enter. And if you're on Google, it'll be the first hit. If you're on Bang or something like that, maybe it's 10 down or whatever. But there'll be one. And it'll say www.virtualbox. That's the one we're looking at. We could go straight to downloads, but let's just click the main button. 
and here we are. This is VirtualBox, and it tells us that the most recent one was January 19th. That's the 6.118, and if we click this giant blue button, that's what it will get us. We can also go find older versions if we need them for whatever reason. And it tells us, uh, well, it tells us all kind of stuff. We don't care. We're just going to click the button. When we click the button, it'll take us to the downloads page. In here, you've got builds for Windows, for OS X, Linux, Holeros, etc. If you're on Windows, click the Windows one. If you're on OS X, click the OS X one. It'll then pick one. This is 6118 and then some build number in the OS X. It's about 110 megs. I click it, I save it, and then I open the installer, which I guess I'll do. I just want to get it installed. Save us some time. And once it's downloaded, which is pretty quick, you can start it up and it'll either be like virtualbox.exe. Well, if you're on Mac, it'll, it'll open up this. If you're on Windows, you'll be starting the, the installer. But once you start the installer, either way, it's going to say, hey, are you sure you want to do that? And prompt you some stuff and tell you, hey, you're going to install this stuff. And then if you're on Mac, you just click the button. But if you're on Windows, you, maybe it tells you a lot more stuff about what it's going to do. But if you want to know what it's doing, you click on Customize. And I'll show you all the stuff it's going to install. It has to install something at the kernel level, because this is a this is a virtual operating system. So um, it it's a little more invasive than your average application. Um, and then it installs the application itself. Uh, maybe it installs this command line feature stuff. And then if you're on Mac, it has Fuse so that it can integrate file sharing. That's kind of it. You hit install and it, away it goes. It takes a couple minutes and then it is installed. So once it's installed, in your application start programs on Windows, um, you have this, it'll show up, VirtualBox. And it's always good to pin it so that you pin it to your taskbar. However you do that um, in Windows, you start the app. Yeah, so I could start it from here. And you can do it the same way on a Mac. Once you start it, it shows up in your taskbar, and then you can right click and you say Options Keep in the Dock or on Mac, on Apple, uh, sorry, on Windows. You can right click it and say Pen to Taskbar or something variant like that. But then once it installs, it just looks like this. And it may prompt you to install the um, extension pack, and you'll want to do that. Um, see, can I make that happen manually? Probably. Okay, so I can't do it for you, but what, let me find, yeah, so if you, if you want to do it with me, you can go down to the VirtualBox downloads, come down to where it says VirtualBox 618 VirtualBox extension pack, and then it's for all extent, all supported platforms. You save that file, or open it, either way, um, and it'll pop open a dialog that says, hey, the extension, for me, it says it's already installed. You want to install it? Sure. Okay. It's, it's what you're going to see. So when you do that, it's going to, uh, either for the first time or on a reinstall, it's going to show you the license. You agree um, if you want to. want it to work. Okay. And then it does it. It installs it. And there it is. Once it's installed, that extension pack gives VirtualBox some capabilities that are helpful, like USBs. So we're going to... Minimize that for the time being. And we're going to look at what's the other prereq? Well, the other prereq is we got to have FreeBSD Media. So let's go get it. Um, FreeBSD, whoops. We look for this um, in Google or whatever. Um, so if we search under DuckDuckGo for you. There it is, FreeBSD first hit. And once we click the FreeBSD uh, thing, it takes www.freebsd.org, and it says we can do stuff. There's all kinds of stuff here, getting FreeBSD documentation. We'll talk that. It shows you all the different releases that are available. It's a very confusing page, but it's very helpful once you are used to it. Um, but all we want to do is click this Get FreeBSD thing. We don't want to select a subset, just click the button. And then it says, hey, you want to download it? Sure enough. And it tells you how to choose an image, which you're free to read about. There's images for all kinds of systems, including VMs we're not going to use. We're just going to pick one of these installer images. So I pick AMD64. 
because um, I'm on a 64-bit machine, meaning I'm on a Mac. Uh, if you're on a Windows machine, it's probably 64-bit, but if not, you'll know that because a lot of stuff is different, but it might be a i386. If you're on an older Mac, you could probably try one of these PowerPC things. I don't know. Um, but anyway, the same D64 thing is what you probably want. Then it gives you a whole bunch of different things. And if you don't know what these are, they're gobbledygook to you, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that they're, they all serve different purposes. Although, I, you know, this mini mem stick thing still baffles me. But um, I guess mini mem sticks probably like boot only, which is just enough FreeBSD to start the installation process. But if you use those versions, you're going to have to configure the networking manually. That's kind of a pain. So usually pick MemStick if you're going to do it to your hardware. But if you're going to do it to a VM, which is what we're going to do, we're going to pick this one, which is basically equivalent to like a little tiny. It used to be the size of a CD-ROM, but now it's bigger than a CD-ROM. Uh, but where it's virtual anyway, so it doesn't matter. But it's not as big as this giant DVD one, um, which has a lot more stuff on it, but we don't need it if we have it in there. So I'm picking disk 1.iso. The XZs are zip files, but you have to have an XZ capable um, zip utility. So we're not going to depend on that. We're just going to download the thing. So I click save it, and it, bzzz, it saves it. But I'm going to cancel it because I've already done it. Um, it'll wind up in your downloads folder when you do that. So without further ado, we're going to do the installation. And this will go really pretty quickly. I'll explain everything that we're doing. So we installed two or we in we installed an application and downloaded a media. So so far, nothing that you haven't probably done a million times. You in you installed the latest application of the uh, whatever Whizbang Cool app you wanted, and you've probably downloaded files that you've then opened later. So that's all we've done, nothing nothing that a beginner wouldn't already know. So now now we're in this weird thing that's called VirtualBox. And it's a beautiful name for a beautiful product, but basically it's a container for virtual operating systems. So I, can, I, can, I could have 10 or 20 of these, and I do. I just took them out of the menu. So they wouldn't confuse you. But I can say, I can just create a new machine. And this is a new virtual machine, a new um, operating system environment, uh, like with virtual hardware. So virtual hard drives, virtual disks, virtual everything. So it's like you can... You only have your host, which is probably, if it's even reasonably recent, it's pretty powerful, has a decent amount of memory, hopefully. I mean, you need to have probably two, meg two gigs of RAM to make any of this work. But most machines these days come with eight, four, eight, or 16. And uh, any of those will kind of work. Eight is better. 16 is way better. Um, and uh, that you can get by with eight. But anyhow, so you got your virtual box thing here. And we're going to create a new machine. So I'm just going to click the new button. Amazing that way. And it's going to ask me for a name and what kind of operating system. I could run Windows inside of a virtual box. So I could run Windows in Windows or Mac. I could run uh, Windows on Mac. I'd have to have the installation media to, to get the install. But we're going to pick FreeBSD because we're going to type it in. So I'm going to call it FreeBSD. And then I know that noticed that when I downloaded it, it was 12.2 and it was 64 bit. So I just, you can call it whatever you want. But this way I know when I'm looking in the list which one it is. When I typed FreeBSD, it pre-populated these two. And they just happen to be right, because it knows I'm on a 64-bit machine. So it figures I want that, but you have to check. So it also tells you where it's going to install it. Like I'm Will Sen, so W Sen is my username. And then VirtualBox VMs is where it stores everything I ever do. So there it is. And it's ready. And I could use expert mode, but we're all beginners. And actually, I never use expert mode. And I am an expert. So here we go. Click Continue. All right, at this point, you have an option for memory size. And this is dependent on how much memory you have. I got tons and tons and tons of memory, um, you know, for a 10-year-old machine. But anyway, um, we, could, we could leave it at 1024, and actually that probably is sufficient for anything a beginner wants to do. So I'm going to leave it and just go continue. But if you only had 2 gigs of RAM, that'd be half your RAM, right? So, but you still need probably 1024, so go ahead and leave that there. Um, and now it's going to ask us what kind of hard drive we want. How big is it that we want? Now, I've got a terabyte hard, hard disk space on SSD on my 10-year-old laptop. But basically, um, we don't need a whole lot. 16 gigs is going to be way more than enough. But if you're shy on disk space, you can probably back that up to like 12 and get by. 
Um, but if you don't have 12 gigs of space on your hard drive, you need to start deleting files to make room. All right, so I'm going to click Create. And I'm going to choose this, uh, the option that it picked, which is VirtualBox Disk Image. But it'll work with other kinds, but no reason to change it. I'll click Continue. And then it says, hey, where, how do you want it stored on physical disk? And you have two options, dynamic and fixed. And dynamic means that when we first start it up, there's nothing on the hard drive, so it's like two megabytes. And as we put files onto it, like if I copied on a, if I installed 500 megabytes worth of stuff, then the disk would grow to 500 plus a little bit um, megabytes in size, even though we said it needed, it was gonna be a 16 gig hard drive. That's the max size. So it'll grow as it needs space. So we're going to just say dynamic because that's sane. Okay. Um, if you had some performance reason, you might. And then it tells you, hey, I'm going to I'm going to create an actual file, and it's going to go inside of the directory that you created, and we're going to name it the same thing as what you created, but it's going to be .vdi, and it's going to be 16 gigs for the maximum size. We create. It does its magic. Boom. And we get a new operating system over here on the left. It's powered off at the moment, it tells us. Um, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit about this too, but um, the, the interface. But basically the stuff where we, we have already set up is here. So we set up a general system, FreeBSD, and we said one mega RAM, or one gig RAM, I'm sorry. And it, and it has a hard disk and floppy drives and stuff. Some of these things we didn't actually see, or, um, configure, but we will, some of them. So the only one that we need to configure to boot this system is we need a storage device set up for the um, for it to boot. So let's try starting it without that first. See what happens um, in just a second. So this is the this is the FreeBSD environment without having anything on the hard drive. So it's just as though somebody gave me a new laptop or a new box put it in my environment. Not a, not a hugely capable system, but it, it, it'll get the job done for what we need. So I'm going to start it without specifying anything else. So there we go. Here's what's going to happen. It pops up and it says, hey, I can't, there's nothing to boot off here. Um, you want to try something? <laughs> okay. And we can choose host or something that's already been, this is this old install and it's not available. So it says not, we don't have anything to boot off. So you click the folder. And it gets, it says, oh, what do you want to do? I can add one here, and then I can pick the one I downloaded. Right? So I'm going to do that. Select it. Now it's available on the list, and it's picked. This one's not there anymore. Um, but anyway, this one that I just added is, so let's pick it. And it becomes selected, and we can start our system. So without further ado, here it is. Start it up. And it shows you VirtualBox's BIOS and then, or Big BIOS or whatever. And then it shows us a menu that's going to auto boot in a few seconds. But boot multi user is selected. It's number one. It tells us it's going to auto boot one, and it does. It loads the kernel, it, it, and the kernel is going to check. Kernel is a fancy word for an application that runs when you first boot uh, before anything's set up. And it starts to set up your hardware. So it finds the USB ports, the CD ROMs. The, the disk controller and all that kind of stuff, and it initializes as much as it can without user input. And then it runs your replica, it runs whatever um, the installation media has defined as the boot, the, the um, applications and stuff to run. So it's going to run the BSD installer or the FreeBSD installer. Here we are, we're in the FreeBSD installer. And it, this is an application um, that's running. And it's running on the fake system we created. It's running off of the CD-ROM um, or DVD-ROM or however you want to put it. But anyway, welcome to FreeBSD. Would you like to begin an installation or use the live CD? Now, it's got it's a text-based installer, so it looks a little clunky, but it's actually quite sophisticated. Um, but it's got three options, basically. And you can't click them with your mouse, but I'm going to show you with the mouse. So you can have... You can have it install the system. You can create, you can open a shell. So if something goes wrong with your system later and you need to do something from the shell, you can enter a shell immediately here. Or you can run the live CD, which boots 
the full system off of the CD. This is the installer, but it, it has a full system on it. And that full system will pop up and you can make repairs and stuff like that. We don't want either one of those, we just want the install. So the way that the interface works in the installer in the virtual machine here is that I can use the arrow keys to go left and right, up and down and that type of thing. So I would just select the one I want and the tab key works at times as well. Uh, but I don't think the tab right now does, but the tab just does the same keys when you have one. So you, the blue highlights what you're going to do, or you can type one of those characters, I, S, or L. Um, usually I just mouse, uh, sorry, cursor over what I want and hit enter. It does some checking of something, and then it shows me this key map selection. Now you're a beginner, and you're like, what the heck, key map? I don't know what key map is. Well, the key map is what determines your, the uh, layout of your keys on your keyboard. And when you first installed, or when somebody first installed the system, they chose your key map for you. And probably if you're in the US, they picked US. If you're in the UK, they picked you know, UK. If you're in China, it's picked China. But you got to know what it is. In this case, it picks what it thinks is a good default. I think it always picks US. Um, and so if, if yours is something else, you got to go find it and pick it. But I'm just going to press Enter. All right, now it says set a host name for this machine. So in Unix land, um, it's assumed that your Unix computer is going to be interconnected with other computers by default. Windows doesn't, it, it kind of assumes that now too, but um, not quite the same way because it, it'll generate a goofy name for your machine, um, which you may not even know exists, uh, like desktop x374497 or something like that. Um, so, but Unix allows you and actually requires you to give some kind of a name. So I'm gonna call it Aster, just cause. It starts with an A and it's interesting. Okay, so I picked Aster. And from now on, if I just wanna to refer to my machine, it's called Aster, simple. And then I can press enter to, to um, select okay. And then it asks me, what do, you, what do you want to install here? And we can go with the defaults. We don't really need kernel debug because beginners and, and probably most experts don't need kernel debugging stuff, but uh, we'll leave it because it doesn't take up much space. And I want to keep things simple. We could also install the source, the ports and the tests and stuff like that, but we don't, eh, this is really more than what we need. If, if it was for my own system, I'd probably pick source, but then again, I can get that from Git, so I probably wouldn't. So I'm gonna say, okay. It says, now, how would you like to partition your disks? And auto UFS, that sounds good, and it is good, but we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do one small thing different than what, uh, what would be a default. Um, but let me tell you what they are. So auto UFS guided disk setup. This is, UFS is the default. It's pretty low memory utilization and stuff. And um, actually, one second thought, I think we will use it um, for that reason. We could do a manual setup, we could do a shell, um, or we could use ZFS. ZFS is probably um, on every system that I actually install, I usually pick ZFS. But ZFS is a, uh, it uses memory. So in this case, we'll stick to the low memory version. The advantage of ZFS over UFS is ZFS allows us to do really easy snapshots and stuff like that so that we can snapshot the system before we make a change and destroy a system. You know what? I'm going to pick ZFS and we'll just live with it. Um, we're not going to have a whole lot of stuff. I don't think it's going to use much memory. So we're going to say okay on this uh, auto ZFS. And, um, but either one you pick, it'll probably be okay. It's just later when we get into uh, making system changes, when I talk about ZFS, if you picked UFS, you can just ignore that part. So here we go. So if we just pick install, it'll prompt us for the sort of things we need to do. Um, all these options are kind of there for people that not, not only know what they're doing, but want to make changes. But for our beginner version, all we need to do is just pick go ahead, and it'll prompt us for what we need. So I'm going to say OK, and it's going to ask us, what do you want to do? And there's, this, is, uh, this is really sophisticated stuff. Um, but you don't need to worry about it. Just pick Stripe, no redundancy. That just means that your hard drive, if we corrupt it, is going to be totally corrupted and there's, no, there's really no recovery other than the, the native tools. And that's complicated, right? 
Um, if we picked mirror, if we had two hard drives, which we didn't set up two hard drives, we only picked one, but if we had two, we could choose the mirror, and if one of the hard drives got corrupted, the other one would keep working, and we could just replace the other one, and life would just go on. And RAID, these different levels of RAID, which they're just exactly what they say they are. They're single redundancy, meaning that if we, if we lose a drive, um, like it disappears from the world, uh, everything just keeps running. And if it's double redundant, if we lose two, <laughs> no worries. And, and we're actually, I'm not even sure that that's totally accurate, but it's close enough uh, for you for right now. But RAID is a way of having multiple drives and allowing for mo uh, single failures, multiple failures, that kind of thing. So, but we're going to pick Stripe. So we pick Stripe, and it tells us, hey, what do you want to use? And then it's got some letters, which are kind of this, this name of our hard disk is good to remember. So either take a note or whatever, or just remember it. But this is ADA0. It's the first hard drive in the, in the system. And that's the one we want to use because it's the only one that's in there. But the reason we want to remember it is because later we'll refer to it when we want to do stuff. So I, I hit spacebar to select it because it was unselected. And if I said, OK, I don't know, maybe, maybe it would complain. But safe, better safe than sorry is to pick it. I selected it, and, and then I have to make sure OK is selected. And then I hit enter. And it tells me, hey, you're going to write to the disk. You sure? And the disk that it says is ADA0. Um, so our first opportunity to recall, what was it, ADA0? Oh, yeah. OK, that sounds right. OK, because if we had multiples, we'd, we'd now know which one we're talking about. So there it goes. It does some stuff. It built some file systems and that kind of thing. And then it installs um, the base system, which is kind of user land, I guess. Uh, the kernel, which is important or the thing will boot. Kernel debug, which I said we didn't need, so so sad that we got to wait for that, but whatever. And then lib32, which gives us 32-bit compatibility um, if we want to run 32-bit apps, which there are a few that are kind of nice to run. And it is thing. So I would fast forward, but it's not really going to take very long. The whole process typically of a BSD install on hardware or, so or virtual or whatever takes maybe two or three minutes. And then it's done. Talking about it takes a lot longer. But uh, it's a very fast install, even on hardware. So while it's installed, I guess we'll talk a little bit. BSD has uh, been around for a long time. BSD was one of the first adopters of the Unix that AT&T um, created. So they've been around. All right. And this is a direct descendant of that work. There we go. So you have, it tells you, please select the password for the system management account. And yet, this is another opportunity to remember something. We're going to create an account called root. Root is all powerful. Like the root account has all the privileges necessary to do anything on the system. So you're going to create two accounts in this, uh, in this video. Um, this one is really important that you remember what you type for the password and remember it and remember that you're called root. Uh, the other one is going to be your user account. You call it whatever. I'm going to call mine WSIN and it's going to have a password and it's what I'm going to normally use to log in and it's very limited in what it's able to do. As far as using Unix for Unix-like stuff, it's perfect. It works great. But for any kind of administrative tasks uh, like shutting down the computer and stuff like that, we have to have the root account information. Right, so do remember this. So give it a password, type it in. It won't echo, so it'll just look like it's sitting there not doing anything, which is actually brilliant. Um, operating systems that give you feedback when you type a password, that's a security risk because people can count those and say, oh, um, or watch them and understand the cadence of how it was done. So safer way to do passwords. Once you've entered in the confirmation, it's just going to go to the next thing. So we have a root account set up, and now it's going to say, hey, select a network interface to configure. And good news, it picked one. I didn't show you in the settings. But if we look in the settings, we can see that it set up an Intel Pro 1000 MT desktop NAT, which is kind of what it thinks we have. So good news. <laughs> we don't have to do anything. We just hit OK. And it says, would you like to configure IPv4? You're a beginner. You're like, what? IP what? I don't understand that. Right? But you don't have to worry, because I'm telling you. Um, IPv4 is the standard for network communications. 
um, for Ethernet, uh, for TCP IP is a protocol, and IPv4 is the established version, been around forever, and it works. So we're just going to say yes. Um, it says, do you want to use DHCP? Well, that's Dynamic Host Co Control Protocol, I think. Um, and it's, it's basically uh, software that allows you to get an IP address from a DHCP server on your network. Now, you usually have a DHCP server on your own network. Um, it's when you got your router, the router kind of does that naturally. Um, if you installed your own router, then you already know how to do that and you set it up there too. But whatever, it just gives you an IP address so you can talk to everything in the, in the area. Um, in this case, VirtualBox, the software you installed, it provides its own DHCP server so that the host can talk to the, uh, the guest, uh, meaning that your Mac or your Windows PC or your Linux PC can talk to FreeBSD running in the VirtualBox if you know the IP address. But you definitely want to use DHCP, um, so you just say yes here. The next one, and it acquires a DHCP list, lease if VirtualBox is working properly. And then it says, hey, would you like to configure IPv6 for this interface? And IPv6 is the latest version of the IP protocol. Um, and it is used for sure by large corporations out there. And it's configured by default on nearly every system, even though it's of limited utility. And it it's, has some overhead. So we're gonna say definitely no. There's no point at all in having it. And then from your, from your local setup, um, it's going to determine some, some DNS servers. And the reason it does all this is because, if we look in, back in our settings, and I'll click on the settings just to bring them up and look at them, we, by default, are enabling Adapter 1 on this network. It's attached to something called NAT, which is called Net Network Address Translation. You can pick other types of um, connections, but NAT is is a kind of a, let's just say it's a, for your, for beginnerness, it's, it's a virtual network, effectively. And so there's no configuration necessary, it's just gonna use it. But it doesn't really, re, it doesn't exist on your network other than on your, your host can always see this machine, the FreeBSD machine, but other machines in your office or home or, or, or local environment are not gonna be able to see this machine. It only, ex, it only exists for the host, right? Um, but whatever the host knows about, it knows about. So the host provided this one. These are open DNS, um, something I configured. But there should be something here. If there's not, you can type 8.8.8.8. That's Google's DNS server. And then 8.8.4.4, the other Google one. Or you can use these, 208.67.222.222 and 208.67.222.20. These are open DNS's version. And it's a little more... Uh, a little less invasive maybe than, than Google. Once you've done that, and maybe you get something, if you're doing this on a uh, work network, the search uh, thing will probably pre-populate with your domain. Uh, but you don't have to put anything there, just hit OK. I mean, just tab to OK so that OK is selected, and then hit it. It says, what, do you, what time zone do you want to have? Remember, these th this, this operating system has been running worldwide for decades. So, um, you could be living somewhere else. For us, uh, for me, I'm sorry, um, I'm in America, so I'm gonna pick number two, America, North and South. And then North and South America is pretty big, there's a lot of countries here, but down here at the end, because alphabetically it falls at the end, the United States of America is 49, I picked that. And then I've, there's a lot of time zones in the United States, but I picked Central, you might be in Eastern, Western, Mountain, whatever the heck. Um, and we pick the time zone. It gives, it tells us that we picked something called EST. Um, does that look reasonable or EST or whatever it is? And you can say, yeah, that's what I thought, or no, and go back and fix it. So I think it looks good, CST. It was picked yes. It could be CDT if it's a different time of year, that kind of thing, but it'll sound reasonable to you. Um, then it looks at the date. Today's February 12th. Today's the Valentine's Day, yay. Um, so I'm, not, I'm just going to skip it. Um, I could used to set it, but I'm not. And then I look at the time and I say 4.14, yeah, that looks uh, off. So I'm gonna go tab, and then I'm gonna change it to, what is this, 15. And then I go to 10, 15. It's because I've probably UTC or something. And then I'm gonna choose set time, and we're done with time setup. 
now it's going to ask us what do we want to run as services and we're we're going to take the easy road and we're going to pick them all but we may may not need them all but i'm going to pick them anyway so i'll explain what they are if you're a beginner you don't really need to know much about these but i'll tell you what they are sshd one's pretty cool um, but local unbound I don't know why it doesn't just tell you that this is like virtual DNS or like caching DNS. Um, it's way more capable than that, but basically it allows you to not have to go to, to do a lookup on the internet every time you want to go somewhere. Um, this happens typically your operating system does it, what we want, but we want a super fast version. So SSHD, this is the secure shell. SSH is pretty much the connectivity protocol for accessing remote systems that uh, outside of a VPN is pretty prevalent. So we're going to use it. MouseD, this is a pointer for the console. You could use the mouse if it worked. On VirtualBox, this is a tricky business, but we're going to let it run anyway. Um, NTP date and NTPD, these just do network time synchronization. Um, and Power Daemon, this is. Uh, not sure. I guess power daemon's reasonable, but it just seems like it adjusts the, the CPU frequency based on utilization. So it'll it'll uh, on whether or not you're interacting with the system or if you're it's sleeping and that kind of thing. Uh, dump dev. This is uh, if you if something crashes, it, it gets saved. The, the state of memory at the time of crash gets. Saved. And as a beginner, I said you probably don't pretty much don't care about these, but you may want to know what they are, so now you know. Moving on. System hardening. Uh, FreeBSD is very advanced uh, in its capabilities. It'll let you configure yourself into a lead box um, and not be able to use anything. These are all options that you could set to further secure your system. However, every selection you make here limits your ability to do to work with the operating system. And um, when you try to do something it won't work, and you won't probably understand why it didn't work. So we're not going to pick any of these, uh, but if you wanted to, you could learn to do them, and I'm not going to explain them either, because uh, frankly, I don't understand how they do what they do, really, and I just know that anytime I select any one of them, things start breaking, and it takes forever to figure out why they break. But if you're a security um, person, then I'm sure you could spend all day figuring it out, and it'll work. But we're not going to pick any of them. So we're just going to hit OK, and it says it moves to the last step of the install, which is to install a user account. So it says, would you like to add users to the installed system now? We, of course, want to, so we say yes. And then it tells us, hey, what's the username? I pick a username that's typically, in my case, I pick first letter of my first name, Will, and all the letters of my last name, Sin. So I am W. Sin, so I pick that. Says, who are you? And I say, oh, I could say Wilson or Patrick Smith or whatever I wanted to. But this is just a descriptive name. Um, it's not used by the system anywhere other than play your full name. The UID, um, you could specify a user ID here, but that's an advanced feature. We can just hit enter. Login group, it creates a group that matches my name unless I tell it different. So we're going to say sure. Just press enter when you want to go with the default. And the default's always displayed in these little brackety. The login group is WSYN. Invite WSYN into other groups. We're going to do that. We're going to install, we're going to invite uh, WSYN into the wheel group. Um, tourists are going to tell you that you might want to add other groups here like operator and video and audio. But we're not, we're not building a system to replace our existing system. We're only using this for a limited purpose. The wheel group is a special group that allows the, you, the user, this user, WSEN, access to administrative functions on, on request. So we'll, we'll add this user to the wheel group. Um, but we'll pick the default login class and we'll pick the default shell, which is SH. The shell provides the command interpretations and anything other than CS, uh, sorry, than SH is going to be a learning curve. <laughs> All right, and no login won't even let you log in. So kind of, it's useful for administrators, not for you. The home directory here is going to default to something rational. So we're going to accept the default. 
And we don't want to mess with the permissions because they work fine the way they are. So we're just going to enter. Now it says, do you want to use passwords? And we say, for sure, yes. Um, do we want to use an empty password? No. Do you want to use a random password? Absolutely not. And it says, enter your password. So you pick your password, whatever you want. Doesn't echo. And then you enter the same one again. Or try to. There we go. And then it says, do you want to lock the account? Uh, nope. This is, my, this is my account. I don't want to lock it. So I'm going to say enter. And then it reviews it for you. It's like, oh, what's the username? Debbie Sim. What's the password? I'm not going to show you. Uh, what's your full name? What's the user ID? In this case, it started with 1001. Um, on a Mac, it'd be 501. So go figure. What, these are just arbitrarily chosen, but it's always good to use whatever they want um, rather than pick in ones. Um, the groups that I'm in, I'm in my own group and I'm in the wheel group so I can become super super user, a root. And then tells me where my home directory is in the file system. And we'll, you know, in a, in a next video, we'll talk about what that really means. But uh, anyhow, um, it's a tree-based file system, as are all file systems. The one on your Windows PC, the one on Linux, uh, Mac, whatever. Um, home mode, we didn't set anything there. And our shell is uh, BenSH. And it's not locked. This looks good. Yes, it does. It means you have to type the word yes. And hit it. It says, hey, that worked. Do you want to add anybody else? And I do not. I'm going to say no. And I'm going to enter. When I do that, we're kind of done. So it's going to say, okay, um, hey, do you want to make any final configuration changes? Did you make some mistakes back setting the host name or the network or whatever? Uh, you could go back and do that. But um, I'm going to hit okay when I have exit selected so we can exit. And it'll say, do you want to make any manual configuration changes? We do not. So I'm going to say no. It says, hey, it's done. Do you want to reboot now? Yeah, we'll reboot. We're going to hope that it ejects the CD-ROM. But if it doesn't, we're going to have to kind of play around with that. But I'm going to pick reboot. But if it reboots and the CD-ROM is in there, it's going to boot the CD-ROM and not our OS. So we'll pick that. So we'll pick reboot, see what happens. We're watching these messages here, hoping that this will go away. And I could remove the disk from the virtual drive. And I could do it now, but what the heck, there it went. It started it up, CD-ROM's still there. Um, so I'm gonna just close it and I'm gonna power it off. And then not wait for it to boot into the installer again. Uh, the machine changes, I'm gonna reload settings I didn't mean to change. And of course it crashed. That's okay though. Um, it's a very resilient program. So there it is. Um, we're going to ignore the fact that it quit unexpectedly. Probably because it had a dialog open, whatever. It's, it's, uh, it's not that buggy probably on your system, but on Mojave, which is the version, the older version of Mac I'm using, it, 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 this interface, it'll crash every once in a while. It doesn't hurt the VMs. The VMs keep running. Um, but the user, I guess you could call this. All right, so now let's take a look at this. Uh, let's look at the settings, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap on this. So if we remember, we set some of this, but we're going to start by clicking on one of these. You can pick any one, but I'll pick general just to convenient. And now it displays the configuration settings for the virtual machine. We got general settings, which are the ones that we configured when we set it up. There are other tabs. I'm going to go through them all, but really the only ones we're going to care about are going to be and I'll restate this in a minute. The general, the system, storage, and maybe network. And audio we can disable because we're not doing audio. But anyhow, so here it is, general. Advanced configuration is for support of stuff that we really can't use right now. Here, clipboard, drag and drop. You can add a description. Uh, we can encrypt the disk. We're not doing any of that. So I didn't make any changes to the general tab. Moving to system. On system, we have a, a one gigabyte of memory, or sorry, one, um, yeah, one gigabyte of memory selected. Um, we could bump that. We can change this anytime that the machine is off. It has a floppy disk for whatever reason, uh, a CD or DVD ROM, um, a hard disk, 
and it's got a chipset. All this is all advanced stuff, which is why I never talked about it. And now I'm interested. So um, we have processors. We could set up multiple processors up to half of our available processors. I've got eight physical CPUs. I could pick four. Um, we could set execution caps. That's a bad idea, but there are times when that might not be such a bad idea. Uh, but there's overhead to setting that. Um, we could also enable this if we had if we had more than four gigabytes of RAM um, configured here, then we would need this enabled. And if we hover it, it'll tell us. But we don't, so we don't do anything. So we could choose a different parallel of para virtualization interface. It picks main default, so we don't change anything. So I didn't change anything either of these first two tabs. Go to display. We could bump the memory for the screen. We could change the number of monitors. We could do all kinds of things. We're not going to do any of that. Um, but we could pick a different, we could enable 3D acceleration, which since we're doing console only stuff, doesn't make any sense. We have uh, the ability to remotely display what we're doing. We can record the video. Um, so those are all options. We didn't change anything on these first three tabs. Looking at storage, we have, you've already seen this a little bit, but we have the actual hard drive, which even after installing uh, FreeBSD, we still have only 1.36 gigabytes in actual size. So we still have room for 15 gigs of stuff. Um, and then we have the CD-ROM, which is currently, in, currently on. We will make a change here because we don't want to boot to the CD-ROM anymore. So we'll remove the disk from the virtual drive. And it'll be empty now, right? So that's that. So we, did, we didn't change anything on the first three tabs, but on storage, we kicked out the CD or the DVD. On audio, um, we're not going to use audio, so we'll just disable it. But if you have it enabled, it doesn't hurt anything, so we can choose not to. So the first three tabs, we didn't make any changes. The fourth tab, uh, we kicked out this, the DVD ROM. And then on the audio tab, we disabled it. On network, um, you can have up to four network adapters. You can choose how the network adapter behaves. In this case, we only want to be talking to the host, so we leave it in that. Um, on advanced settings, we can see what kind of uh, adapter we have. You can see our MAC address, which is always available to um, people to query on your network. So it's fake. Um, and then there's the cable is connected, yay. Um, that means that the network will work. It's as though you plug the physical cable into your device. There's port forwarding. Um, we could choose port forwarding. And if we did, it would look like this. I want to show you. Don't do it. Um, I mean, you can, look, you can look here. But we would have to add a new rule. We choose a protocol, what the IP address on the host is, meaning the Mac or Windows, Linux, PC that you're running the virtual box on. Um, we can we just make it up. It would be some valid number. And then our guest IP and port um, would be whatever port we want to have access to on the guest. So a real world example is I'd click this. You don't have to do this right now. And I call it SSH. I'd say the port number on my local machine is some number between less than 64,000, more than 1,000. And then uh, on the guest port, SSH runs on port 22. And I would save that. And then I could use SSH from my local system to talk to the guest. But I'm going to cancel because I'm doing that at this time. So we didn't make any changes to the network tab or the first three tabs. The only two tabs we've worked on so far are the storage and audio. Storage did the CD kick out, and audio I just disabled. So for ports, you can enable a bunch of different ports. So if you had a um, device of some sort or serial port, the need to talk to a serial device, not over USB, then this is where you configure it. If you pick the USB tab, you can enable the USB controller. So if you wanted to talk to a USB device, you could add that device in here and, and your um, virtual box would control that device by default. The, um, USB 3.0, if you have a USB 3.0 controller, you could pick that. You don't need any of this because this is a beginner tutorial. So we're going to leave all that the same. So we didn't make any changes here. 
or in network or in the first three. So shared folders. We could mount and share a folder. In order to, for any of these um, mounts or shared clipboards or any of those types of things, we have to install additional software on the guest. So I'm not messing with that for this. And then we have the ability to change the user interface, which is somebody somewhere uses this, but it is dangerous because if you mess with your user interface, you could make it very difficult to, uh, to use your system, uh, to use VirtualBox. So we're going to leave all that the same. So to recap, what did we change? We changed in storage, we removed the device from, um, sorry, we removed the CD, DVD, and in audio, I just disabled it. And that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. So those, those are the two changes that we made. I will save those changes, and you can tell that they're saved because now the DVD is empty. So without further ado, let's boot our new system. So I click Start again, and it starts up. And this time, instead of booting off the CD because the CD is no longer there, it boots off the hard drive. The boot looks the same. It's, got, it's going to do the same thing, boot into multi-user, but this time it's running everything from my local system. So it is not the same, the DVD version. And it's, the kernel is doing the same thing, setting up file system, the disk drives, the USB, Ethernet. And now it's actually getting the IP address and setting up the caches for DNS and it's going to set the date and do a few other things, and then it comes to a login screen. At this point, you can log in, but let's kind of look at what's going on here. So it says, hey, it's Friday, February the 12th, 10.32 in the morning, Central Time in 2021. That sounds right. Yay. <laughs> that means we did something right. And then it says FreeBSD, AMD64, so it's a 64-bit version of FreeBSD. Its host name is Aster. And it's running on TTY v0, which is gobbledygook to you, right? But it's telling us that it's TTY is a teletype terminal type or something like that. Uh, but basically, it tells us what this little screen here is virtual, and it's just one of many op that are available to us. Um, we could switch between them with a key press and get completely different screens, so to speak. Um, but this one happens to be. Um, TTYV0, which is the console. So this is the same as if you were on your laptop and it actually booted. That screen that you see is the console. Um, so without further ado, let's log in. So I can log in with one of two. There's only two accounts that we set up. Um, there's root, and I'd have to remember root's password. And then there's my account, which is WSIN. I'm going to start with that one. Log in. I have to type my password. If I type the password incorrectly, it just says login incorrect, and it asks you for your login again. It doesn't ask you for your password again. So you have to start over with your name and then your password. Once you log in, screen displays some stuff, and it tells you, hey, go here for more info. I don't really care about any of that, but it's a, it's a kind of a helpful thing. Um, so we, we logged in. I'm going to type exit to get out of this account and we're going to log back in as root. I type root and the root password. All right, and it looks kind of the same except for this time instead of have you send it shows root at aster it shows me where where I am in the file system the tilde means the, the user's current directory so wd we can see that this is in slash root and then the pound sign tells us that we're operating at root. We could hurt things. I'm going to exit again, and I'm going to log back in. As well. And we're going to see kind of the same information, but it says, it says WSIN at aster colon tilde, and then a dollar sign. Well, tilde this time doesn't mean slash root. Tilde this time means home WSIN. So it'll all, the tilde will always be relevant to what, what user you logged in as. So in this case, Anytime I log in as WSIN, that tilde means home WSIN. So it's shortcut, so I don't have to type all these characters. Um, I can actually type ls, list files, and a tilde, and it'll, <laughs> there's nothing in there. But uh, if I do 
give me all files, then it shows me the files that are in that directory. Anyhow, so I'm going to exit yet again, because this isn't really the how to use it tutorial. And then I'm going to log in as root. I'm going to type root's password. And we're going to shut down the system. So to click, because you can't just hit power off, you'll corrupt the file system on any decent file system, including Windows. Um, that's why you have to log out, shut down. So we're going to do that from this command window here. Uh, word of warning. Um, and you may or may not have noticed it because you didn't really care before, but now you probably do care. Anytime you click into this window, say that we are in this window and I'm typing some uh, new wisdom, that kind of thing, right? Um, um, if I click into this window, I, my mouse goes away. I'm moving my mouse, but you don't see anything because it's captured by this window. And you may or may not know how to get out of it, so it's bad. So to get out of it, you press the host key, which on Mac is the left command key. But on Linux, I think it's the left control key, or it could be the right control key. Um, but just press... Control Alt on both sides of the keyboard, and sooner or later, your little mouse will show back up as soon as you press it. So there it is, and then you can go back and forth between the two. Um, this is a mild annoyance, but we can deal with it. Um, if you go full screen, it takes over the whole screen, and you're wondering how to get it back. Um, Command F or Control F or Host F will get it out of full screen mode. All right, that's it. But let's shut down. So shut down is a command called shut down. And we can tell it to power off with dash P. And we can tell it when, as in now. If we don't remember that, we have options. Shut down, dash, dash, help. We'll tell you kind of in very concise terms how to do it. So shut down dash and some characters. The P is the one for power off. And then time now is an option. Or you can type man power off. Man, not power off. Man shut down. And it'll show you the man page. Put you at a colon prompt, which you got to know, hey, what well, was the colon thing? So you can use the arrow keys in here to find out what those things mean. So dash P says the system's halted and the power's turned off. Um, and then what about that time thing? Time is the time at which shutdown will bring the system down. You can do it in seconds, minutes, or hours. I don't even, it doesn't even tell you about now, but you can, you can type now. And that so how do we get out of the system? You can hit Q to exit the, the man page. Oh, wow, we got some beginner stuff in. Okay, but as it turns out, all we want to do is shut down, shut down dash P now. And when you hit enter, it will start shutting the system down, shutting down the uh, disks, turning off the services, doing all that kind of stuff. And uh, kind of it. And eventually it will go away. There it goes. And if we look at the GUI, which crashed again. Um, there we go. Um, it will say powered off. Which is good. All right. Don't kill me about the VirtualBox diet. I have no control over that. FreeBSD is un unharmed and will always uh, continue to function. And then just restarting this fixes whatever it is. I entered a bug report on this, uh, I don't know, eight weeks ago, and nobody's yet responded. So sooner or later, they'll fix it, hopefully. Although Mojave is aging. So that's kind of it. That's kind of all I wanted to cover. So the, next, the, the, the last little bit here is about next steps. Where do we go to get help? How do we find resources? And what's going to be in these beginner videos? So this is really the most complicated beginner to video of the bunch, is getting it installed. Once it's installed, all right, it's going to be a little bit smoother sailing. So next video is going to talk about how to use your system. You've, you've never used Unix. What's it good for? We'll cover a very small handful of topics, and you'll be on your way. Um, as far as getting help, um, probably the best place to go for help is freebsd.org. Okay, is to go to the community and go to the forums. All right, there are other mailing lists and Twitter pages and stuff like that and all that, but the forums is really good. So if we go to the forums, 
and uh, start looking around. You have to accept the uh, cookies if you want that to go away. Um, if you're having issues with anything, you can go in here and go, oh, I'm having some problems with installation. Um, after I upgraded, this was a problem. Install, I won't even start. You know, you can put your question into the forums. Hey, I know this is trivial, but I, I don't know what to do. Here's what I try to do. Here's some background. Help me out. And then people are like, oh, good job. Hey, what did you do? And then they try to help. Um, and if this person sticks with it, they'll get their answers answered. All right, so that's probably your best bet. The next bet after um, community is documentation. So there's a book called The Handbook, and The Handbook talks about everything. Like how do we get it installed? What do we need to do before we install? How do we use this? How do we use that? And then it goes on and on and on and on and on um, into stuff like advanced networking topics, um, network services. You know, so you start easy with the, hey, how do I get it installed? And you go from there. Um, anything that you want to know how to do, they'll have a version of how to do it. Um, and so that's a good one. The next thing is, how do we find resources? So your best place to find resources is to type it into your search box. So in FreeBSD, I can't get my NVIDIA card working. Type in your question, whatever it is. And it'll do this thing. Here's how to install the video drive. So that's your best bet. The next best bet is go to YouTube or I would hope for some open source alternatives at some point. But in here, we can type stuff like, uh, how do I get my NVIDIA card working? <laughs> it's the same search. All right. Uh, and see, uh, installing the recommended way for NVIDIA. This is RoboNuggy who does a great job of FreeBSD videos. Um, getting your X graphics console. Or it, anyway, this is your next best bet for re resources. And then there's the videos that I'm going to do. Hopefully, you'll find them interesting and helpful. But with that said, welcome to the Unix world, and I hope you have a good time.